It's an honor for me to be one more time in front of you after five years working for Lifer. It was a great adventure. So today I'm going to talk about best practices for creating modern web applications. And since we all create web applications, we're supposed to do, we always, since the web was invented, are fighting with some challenges. And among those challenges, there are like manipulating the DOM. How do we do that? Do we directly modify the DOM? Do we use virtual DOM, red DOM? How do we do that? How do we handle the events? How do we subscribe, unsubscribe to events? How do we maintain the state? Because state might be spread among multiple different services, components, or it may stay in one place following the flux pattern. How do we perform unit tests? Shall we mock everything? Or we should stay as close as possible to the reality? But then we have integration and end-to-end -end tests. So how do we keep them in sync? How do we optimize the application? How, shall we rendering on the server? Shall we bundle all the files together? What about HTTP 1, HTTP 2? How do we make changes to the system and how do we prevent the software rot when it's so hard for the developer to make a change that he literally pushes it back and the software finally is left to die? How do we do continuous deployment and delivery? How easy is to make releases? And finally, how do we keep the documentation in sync? And there is no silver bullet for that. There is not one single solution. Some of those challenges are technical. Others are not. And as we all know, technical changes are easier to solve. Since the beginning of web, multiple frameworks were invented, frameworks and libraries. And framework, you know, someone tells you how to write an application and gives you the tools for writing it. And if we took a briefly look at the history, there were many popular frameworks and libraries. jQuery shaped really the way we were writing web applications back 10 years ago. Uh, YUI then it invented some kind of modular approach for writing them. Backbone appeared, Angular one, Ember, React really made a revolution in the way we were writing web applications. Now Angular 2 was released, and in 2007, no one knows what will happen. But I'm, here I'm showing the most popular ones. It doesn't mean that those are the best ones. It's up to you to find that one which fits your needs. Library has its own. It's OK if it fits your needs. If you're happy with that, go ahead with it, stay with it. But regardless of the framework, your lovely and favorite framework, there are some fundamentals of designing the application architecture. And critical problem here is how do we define our components and models? And I still see some misunderstanding what's component, what is a model. So I would like to start with this question. What actually is a model? And in application, a model is nothing but a piece of functionality, right? It's a piece of functionality which could be plugged to the application. Then it could be replaced if needed and possibly reused in other applications. One model consists from one or more components and the third rule is that one component should stay in one model. You can't have multiple components in the same time in different models loaded to the application. And if we take a look at the real world, what components and models are, we will see that if you get, for example, kit toys, you get a box, right? And you're supposed to build robots, windmill, airboat, and other things like that. So if you want to create a robot, when you unbox, you get a frame. And this frame, there are components. Those things, there are uh, one or more components, which you get from the framework. And you assemble them, and you create a model. This is what drives the robot forward, right? We use one or more components, we create model, then we wire it somehow. And, but this provides a piece of functionality. Then we create another model. This is the top part of the robot plus the solar panel, right? We assemble this model too, and when we do it, we get the end product. This is the 
robot wired and ready to use. And if something gets wrong, something doesn't work, you unplug, you disassemble, you create another model, you plug it, it will work again. In the same time, you may build using those components, the robot, you may build many other different toys by reusing the components, by assembling different models. And this doesn't apply only for toys for kids. It applies for way more complex things, like, for example, the International Space Station, because it's also built from components and then assembled into the models. And when you fit all those models, you get this one, what the International Space Station, which circles somewhere there right now. And when we design, when we build an application, it's better to follow the same model, and this is where things go wrong usually. Right? It's easy to say, but it's hard to follow. So I'm going to try to offer you some practical guidelines, which I am following the last years. And the first basic rule is that we, we consider features as models. Right? We separate the features of, of an application in model. When I open the application structure and I'm going to work on some feature, I shouldn't wonder where to go. I go to this folder where this model is, and it should contain everything. All its components, dependencies, services, everything. I don't go searching the whole application. I go there and start fighting the bug on or implementing an issue. One model may consist from multiple components, and not only components, services, pipes, if you singular to, um, or let's say um, directives or whatever. Everything what is needed should be there. Then this feature should be tested individually, right, and included to the application. When you include it, it provides some value to the whole application. And when we talk about components, I would say, prefer to create dummy components, those which, will, which only render data. Like, they have some input, and they have to provide some output. Usually this is a small part of the view which will be rendered to the page. Prefer to create as much of those components which only render data. Then create a few other components to maintain the state of the application. Because you always will end up with some with some way of maintaining the state. That regardless, it's spread, spread into different services, or you have a central storage for it, you always have a state. Create a few components which deal with it, and those components will provide data to the rendering components. Right? Then, the, then when there is an issue, or when you want to implement a feature, it's easy to track. It's easy to spot the error. And that's what we want. We want to implement features as fast as possible, and find and fix bugs as fast as possible. And when testing, mock the external dependencies. Um, there are a few philosophical schools here. They say that you either have to mock everything, the external dependencies, or stay as close to the reality. For unit tests, I say go ahead and mock the external dependencies. You mm, test your component, not there, not there. And another rule would be to avoid framework dependencies when possible. Try to make the classes framework agnostic. Most, the, most of the modern frameworks, libraries, they have some way to glue those components to the framework. For example, Angular 2 has ES7 um, a feature, which is called decorator. But until some class is decorated, it's not related to Angular. In React, you extend from React component. If you keep your classes isolated from the framework and then create on top of that someone which they glue, you'll be a safe place. Tomorrow, it will be easier for you either to expose those models to another library or to another platform just to deliver or just to replace this framework which is not anymore modern. Maintaining the state is, from what I have seen, is the key property to keep the, the whole application maintainable. And uh, I say go ahead and use Flux Pattern and some implementations like uh, Redux, Mobex, write your own. There is nothing wrong with that, but avoid trying to 
keep the state of your application spread in different services. It's, it, it takes time just to restore the state, not to what means to find bug when it happens. And another rule which I have seen in the past is that there are new developers or newcomers which, and they blindly follow the documentation or, or examples. For example, if you go to a Redux site, there is a directory called real world application, right? But if you see how it's structured, you have actions, components, containers, reducers, and what this application does, no one knows because the features are not separated here. We have actions, but this doesn't mean anything. Avoid this uh, approach. Try to keep your features as a modules and put the actions inside. Put the reducers there. So when I open the application again and start working with it, trying to fix bug or implement new feature, I go there. Do not follow this approach. And then we go to the testing each and every component separately, right? We have a few components, we test them, they go into module one, module two, or somewhere else, and then, of course, we test the whole system in order to be, because unit tests are not enough. We want to, we said we are going to mock the external dependencies, but this doesn't mean the application will work. We, we haven't prove anything. We have to see how the whole models work in conjunction, right? Then try to pack the models and distribute them. It may be NPM or some other model system, it doesn't matter, but try to, try to write those models in this way that tomorrow you can expose them to someone else, to some external repository, to some of your other applications, try to, try to write it in this way. It might not happen right now, but it might happen tomorrow. Be prepared for that. And when you design the system, since the beginning, try to design the system with the idea to share code with other people. This really shapes your mind and tries and forces you to think how easy it would be tomorrow when another developer comes and asks, may I use this functionality, it's really cool. And you start scratching your head and say, no, you can't because it's so high couple that you, you can't. But if you start with the idea that someone may ask for your code or your package tomorrow, you would shape it way better. In JavaScript world, if we go to them, there were a few model systems invented during the years. I said about YUI and their own model system. Mainly they are three, ECMAScript 2015, CommonJS, AMD, CommonJS made popular by Node in 2013. The author of NPM said it's dead. Um, AMD was split from CommonJS. So when you adopt, go with ES 2015. It has many cool features, and we will briefly take a look on them. You have multiple named exports, right? So you, you may export a few things, not only one thing. Not you may export a few classes. You have also single default export. And you have way better support for cyclic dependencies. Not that you should have cyclic dependencies in your code. Uh, avoid that as a plague. But, when, but if you think you really need them, stay with 2015, ES 2015. It's way better implemented than in common JS. For example, CK Editor 5, they switch to ES 2015 only because it handles better cyclic dependencies, and in their tests, they really they have cyclic dependencies. They can't get rid of them. They switched only because of that feature. For you, it shouldn't matter. It's it's a, it's some syntax inside the file, like import, whatever. But when you need, you may leverage of those features. And of course, you can re-export some. Um, you can re-export some model in another one. If you, if you imported it, you can then re-export it, right? So <clears throat> I would like to see how then armed with this knowledge we create uh, modular web applications in practice. 
And we may try to create an application for monitoring iBacons in Rage, which such system could be part of a bigger one, which we call uh, indoor positioning system. And what an indoor positioning system means, so you, to obviously this means that we know when, the, when someone with a mobile device in hand walks, we know where this guy is, and we may provide him some services, right? Uh, a real indoor positioning system usually requires venue maps. It requires to detect and monitoring Wi-Fi and iBacons. We will concentrate on monitoring iBacons uh, I especially. You need some indoor radio mapping tool, which will create a grid from the Wi-Fi signals and beacons. You need positioning API in order to determine where this user, this guy is. And then, at the end, you need location services and to provide end-user applications on top of that, right? It's a pretty complex system. It's not something simple. But we'll concentrate on just monitoring them. So usually, you have iBacons. They are placed on the wall. Here, I don't see any, but you may... I have a few of those here. They, they may look like this. They may look like on this picture. You place them in, on the wall, and then the user, using the Bluetooth of his uh, mobile phone or whatever, he goes, and then the location is known. Usually, then this data is being sent to some server, which collects it, returns back some useful data to the mobile device, to the user, and then we either display some information in a web application, or we enrich this data, or we anchor in Anchor, we can anchor it with, with other data which the company provides. For example, that could be maps. So we can map location with, uh, with the maps of the company, right? And then we provide services on top of that. For now, we want only to monitoring the bacons. We want to display them on a mobile device to send this data to the server and then to display them on a, on a web application. So what architecture we may end up with? We, of course, need a mobile application, and we will implement it using React Native. We will have a web application. It will be, again, created with a React. We need some storage where the data from the bacons will be stored, and then it could be enriched and anchored. And we need, of course, some server to serve the web application, right? So when we start, we start thinking what are the features of this system, especially what could be reused. How can we, what, what, which parts could be reused? How can we, even for something so simple, there should be something to be reused. reused. And don't forget that we have web application and a, and a native one. So the first candidate for reusing is, of course, the communication with the server. The mobile send application send data to the server, <clears throat> then it sends to the web application, and this is the perfect candidate to be isolated in a model. And of course, there are different ways to achieve it. We can achieve it with uh, pure web sockets. We can use we deploy a new cool library uh, service, or we can use some other method. But for you, this should be a model. It should be a feature, right? And you isolate, you may implement with whatever you want. And, of course, detecting the bacons on iOS Android could be also uh, a model. Because you still need, despite we use React Native, we still some native code to be written. Java for Android, Swift or Objective-C for iOS. And we, for both systems, we isolate the logic in models with the, with the same API, and we expose it to the React Native. Right? So when tomorrow, so my, when you update something, when the developers who are creating the, um, the libraries, if they change something, I don't care. I have the same interface on my, uh, on my mobile application, my React application. I don't mind. When usually when you implement such a um, system for detecting iBacons, when they have been traversed, you get the information as an array. For example, there are five visible 
iBacons. But the order in they are coming, you can't predict the order. And if you just order them in order of appearance, every second they might be different. For example, bacon, which is currently four, may appear on the first place. And the, this, this is really bad user experience. The, the, the whole application will start to flush. But we want to render those in the same way in the mobile and on, on the web, right? So we isolate this in a model and we reuse the same code. Since we use React Native for React, we isolate in a class or file which doesn't have anything to do with React. This is pure JavaScript code and we reuse it in both applications. So what else? We can try to make the web application isomorphic. This is uh, another key feature. Mm, to, there is no better way to provide good user interface, uh, user, sorry, user experience, unless to make it isomorphic. You may go with just an application which renders everything on the client. It will work. People do that for, year, for years. But it's better to make it isomorphic. Render everything before that, serve on the server, serve prepared HTML with your Redux state already prepared, then if you use Redux, of course, then React will pick it and continue to render. And what else? You may consider to make the communication part replaceable on the fly. So on theory, each, this communication channel which we currently use, whatever it is, we deploy whatever it may break, it happens. But you may, if you, if, you, if you have written this model properly, then you should be able to, to replace it on the fly, right? To switch the communication from WeDeploy to some uh, Ajax or vice versa, whatever, or WebSockets, pure WebSockets, whatever works for you. And uh, I went ahead and I prepared, tried to prepare uh, this application and I I'm going to try it. This is, uh, this is a phone, right? It's Android, and those are the bacons, which I, I, I have. I have one more here on the, on the machine, which, is, which doesn't require battery, right? So what we want? We want, when we start the application, we want, the, we want to see what is the status of this uh, bacon here, and we want to receive the information from from we deploy. And if it work, if it works, yeah, it works. You see, I have currently one bacon, which is this one on the machine, and I see exactly the same information in real time. Can we try to? Move? I see exactly the same information here, and on the machine. And this uses the same models, the same code, almost the same code. It uses just different CSS. And I may try to include another bacon. It appears on my Android device, and it appears there. This goes currently to LA, right? Where, I don't know where the servers of WeDeploy, WeDeploy are. They are probably somewhere in LA, but it still works in real time. And here, yeah, because I'm, you see, I changed the, it, now, it's in, now, now it's intermediate, it's very close. This bacon is very close, and it automatically updates on the, Android device and on the screen. So I was not able to use we deploy currently on Android, but I went ahead and implemented it using raw sockets or web sockets. But here on the on the web, what you currently see, it uses we it uses we deploy to retrieve the information. I may pluck another iBacon, it should appear, and so on. I can include as much as possible here. So then this data is on the server, and I may do whatever I want. I may enrich it, I may anchor it, I may do whatever I want with it. And this is what I tried to prepare for you guys. Hope it will be helpful for you. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, the question would be, uh, you told, okay, you will uh, have the communication to the server as a module. 
Um, maybe uh, you have some three apps using that module, but they have different requirements. So uh, over the time, that, that module will grow and grow and grow based on the requirements of the other modules which you created. How will you handle this? Well, when the requirements change, usually we change also the model. If you, whatever, you may create another, of course, you may create another version of the model. You, you, the question is, the, the point here is to keep your API as consistent as possible. And communication, the communication, I don't see how it may grow that differently because currently it, it sends only raw JSON data to some server. It uses, in this case, it uses um, WebSockets to send just JSON data. So this, if you, uh, how you shape this JSON data, for example, this application may send one set of data inside the JSON. You may set another set, but the, but the, but the transfer is the same, it's still JSON. If you keep that, it shouldn't be that different. You just have to carry from one application different set of data and, and receive, of course, different data. You have different implementations for the different three systems, but still the protocol and how do you carry this data should stay the same. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, so we have right, anything else? Or anything else? No, I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> if you guys want to, if you guys guys want to know more about what I said, you are free to pick me there. I will be around. And again, it was a pleasure for me to be one more time with you. Wish you luck, and write your applications in a modular. Avoid monoliths. That's those are my final words. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>